Baik. Kita masih punya waktu dua menit sambil menunggu juga dengan Dokter Egi. Sudah ditunggu. Hello everyone. Hello, Dr. Aiki. Good afternoon. Hello, Dr. Aiki. Your voice is not that Hi. loud. Okay, so we already have uh, all the ages in our room right now. And I hope that all presenters already here. Can we start now, Pak Doni? Please. Okay, sure. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for your participation uh, in this uh, event, Gamma ICTM 2022. We, especially we receive many papers, many abstracts um, with the topic of COVID-19. And very hard that we should um, choose uh, the best six uh, of all of those uh, abstracts. Um, so now we already have six uh, participants in this breakout room. This breakout room is for um, abstract those uh, has topics of uh, COVID-19. Let me introduce myself. I will chair this uh, room. My name is Egi. And here we have uh, judge, judges, uh, Dr. Doni. Dr. Doni, hi. Okay. Hi. Okay. And uh, we also have uh, Dr. Anggraini Alam. Hello. Hello, hi. Dr. Anggi. Oh, thank you, Dr. Egi, for your invitation. Yes. On mute. I, I, I have already uh, mute. Okay. Unmute myself. Is sure. my uh, voice clear? Yes, yes, clear. Thank you, okay. Dr. Egi, for your invitation. Sure. Uh, from PropMap. Yeah. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anggi, for joining us. Uh, so, everyone, uh, we will start um, this session. Each presenter will have uh, seven minutes. And then after that, we will have discussion. And we also invite all of the participants to have questions or comments. And then, uh, but we do have the limitation of the Q&A session, maybe about five to seven minutes each presenters. So please uh, make sure you had on time for your presentation. So, okay. Uh, let's start from the first presenter, Amila Hanifan. Are you already here? Okay. Okay, the time is yours. Uh, thank you for all judges and the committee. Excuse me, may I best start to share screen? Yes. Please. Excuse me. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, honorable to all judges, the audience, and the and the committee. My name is Amil Hanifan. In this opportunity, I would like to present a study entitled "High Level Antibody RBD Among Healthcare Before Second Booster." 
for introduction, WHO declared COVID-19 in pandemic for the first time in March 2020. COVID-19 in Indonesia reached the peak wave of confirmation case in January 2021. Furthermore, there were other waves in COVID-19 in Indonesia, second wave in July 2021 with Omicron variant, and the third wave in February 2022 with Delta variant. Vaccination is necessary to prevent COVID-19. In July 2021, there is a policy of Ministry of Health in Indonesia that regarding provision of the uh, dose vaccine for health human resource in Indonesia. In Hasan Sadikin Hospital, vaccination has been carried in January 2021 and the second dose in February 2021 and the third dose or first booster in July uh, 2021. Vaccination that you see in Hospital Hasan Sadikin, first vaccine are uh, inactive vaccine Sinovac, second vaccine are uh, inactive vaccine Sinovac, and the third vaccine are uh, MRA uh, Moderna. This study is a sequential uh, survey. Uh, first survey uh, is conduct in uh, July 2021 before uh, third vaccine uh, are provided for healthcare worker. And then uh, the second survey uh, are conduct in August 2021, and the last survey are conduct in uh, August 2022, 12 months after uh, first booster and right before second booster. Uh, for for vaccine dose or the second COVID-19 vaccine booster are recommended for healthcare worker in Indonesia. Antibody level from the first three vaccine dose expected to win on all person. However, high transmission of SARS-CoV-2 uh, may keep antibody level high. So this study is aimed to determine the SARS-CoV antibody RBD level in healthcare worker in Hassan Sadikin Hospital to consider if the policy of fourth vaccination is necessary. Method of this study is a second as is sequential uh, survey of healthcare worker in Asa Sadikin Hospital Bandung. First survey uh, are conducted in July 2021 before provision of the vaccine mRNA. Second su survey conducted in August 2021, one month after the third dose. And the third survey are conducted in August 2022, right before the fourth vaccine dose. This study are measures uh, SARS CoV as RBD antibody level with use immunochromatography assay fast BRPD with limit seropositive in uh, 20 uh, bending antibody unit and maximum detection uh, is limit in uh, 4,000 binding, anti binding antibody unit. This study uh, is use uh, convenient sampling and uh, for categorical data, uh, there is uh, analysis with G square test that uh, if unfulfilled with uh, use exact Fisher test and for numerical data is analyzed with man with me test for uh, variable that have uh, an p value uh, under uh, 0.25 uh, are analyzed using multivariate logistic regression and significant value is uh, use uh, p uh, in uh, 0.05 uh, result of this study, uh, there are first survey, second survey, and third survey. For first survey, there are uh, 570 uh, uh, participants. For second survey, there are uh, 355 participants. And for third survey, there are 330 uh, participants. Uh, most of participants are female with presentation uh, about 6% in all uh, survey. And for uh, median of age, uh, about uh, 28, uh, 38 until uh, 41. And most of uh, participants are in uh, 31 until 40 years old, about uh, 20, uh, 30%. And for the participants, uh, most of them uh, actually in second survey are doctor with presentation of 5, 58%. And uh, several, although uh, all participants are have a full 
the vaccination until third vaccination or first booster, uh, there are still uh, infection case in participant. In first survey, there are uh, 22 percent. Uh, in second survey, there are uh, 90.5 percent, and in third survey, there are uh, 37.5 uh, percent of infection in the partic participant. In this study, uh, we conduct three survey uh, about antibody level in healthcare worker. Uh, for first survey, there are uh, median about uh, 31.4 uh, bending antibody unit, with uh, most of them are uh, under 4,000 bending antibody unit. And uh, after one month, uh, after one month first booster vaccine, uh, there are increased median of antibody level, increase uh, into very high about uh, with median 4,000 banding antibody unit. And most of them are have a high antibody with 57.7% uh, participant are uh, above 4,000 uh, binding antibody unit. After the survey, uh, 12 months uh, from first booster dose uh, or right before second booster, in healthcare, uh, in Hasan dan Sadikin Hospital, most of them have uh, keep antibody uh, keep antibody high. That uh, most of them uh, eighty eight point one percent or total to uh, about uh, medi with median uh, four thousand binding antibody unit. Only uh, thirty nine per uh, participant that have antibody under 2000, 4000 binding antibody unit. Uh, this is the box plot of antibody level in uh, all survey. For the first survey, we see uh, we can see that the median uh, only 41 uh, binding antibody unit, and uh, one month after third dose, the antibody is high with median of uh, 4,000 binding antibody unit. And after 12 months, after third dose, the antibody uh, keep uh, remain high with median of uh, 4,000 binding antibody unit. This study uh, show us that most healthcare workers in Hassan Sadikin Hospital have very high level of SARS-CoV RBD antibody level 12 months posted COVID-19 vaccine dose. Uh, this, uh, Study also uh, similar with other study in Fargas et al. and uh, Sukwara et al. that uh, participant with uh, given Sinovac vaccine and third vaccine with uh, NRA vaccine have high uh, antibody level. This uh, study also have bivariate analysis that variable is analyzed with uh, factor fa several factor that can influence antibody level. Uh, in bivariate, bivariate analysis, we can show, we can see that uh, doctor are uh, associated with uh, antibody level in healthcare, work, healthcare worker in Hasadikin Hospital with a value of 0.052. Uh, other variable that we also analyze are gender, age, uh, red zone, comorbidity, uh, cross contact, and less COVID-19 infection. You can see here that the uh, doctor has a high uh, has lower antibody with uh, antibody that above four thousand bending antibody unit are eighty four point five percent and other occupation non doctor are ninety one point four percent and for uh, COVID infection Amila you have remaining one minute left. In COVID-19 infection, uh, there are participants with uh, antibody of above 40,000 uh, binding antibody unit have 85.5% infection COVID-19. Uh, and then variable analyze in multivariable analysis that has a given similar uh, result that doctor are associated with antibody level with p-value 0.05. So 
So in this study, we conclude that we did not find winning of humoral immunity to COVID-19 among healthcare workers in our hospital. Perhaps this is due to the high transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Most healthcare workers have high very have very high level of SARS-CoV-2 as RBD antibody, 12 months posted COVID-19 vaccine dose. Based on this result, we should consider if fourth vaccination dose is necessary. Uh, thank you for the and for thank all you. this and committed. Good yeah, afternoon. Thank you. thank you, Amila. Nice presentation. Now I invite um, comments or questions from audience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Egi. Okay. I want to uh, ask uh, Amila, uh, is the booster uh, uh, too late? Because 37.5% healthcare worker in Hassan Sadikin has already infected before the fourth doses. And uh, you said that uh, many uh, healthcare workers have a high level of RBD, but uh, they are still infected. Uh, do you think the high level of RBD uh, just showed the uh, zero positivity uh, level, or it uh, and is it? Uh, also show us the zero protection or protective level of uh, for the healthcare worker. What do you think about that? Thank you, uh, Dr. Angi. In this uh, study, uh, we uh, shows that uh, there are high antibody level in healthcare worker. Uh, all Although uh, there is high antibody level in healthcare worker above four thousand, but the infected uh, people uh, is still uh, shows that is there are about eighty five percent, about a one hundred oh six percent that have infection, and for all uh, participants there is still one hundred. Uh, 24 percent that have uh, COVID infection. So in this study, uh, are uh, show us that the high level of antibody are can cause because of uh, the infection of COVID nineteen, uh, and uh, also because of uh, COVID nineteen vaccination. But uh, the antibody level uh, cannot show the protection from COVID nineteen infection because. Uh, although the vaccination, uh, the antibody level are high, uh, there is still uh, 124 person that have COVID-19 infection even in the high antibody level of COVID-19 antibody. How about the severity of infection for all infected healthcare? Uh, uh, thank you for the question about the severity level. Uh, most of them are in a mild and asymptomatic, uh, mild and asymptomatic uh, COVID nineteen infection. Only one person that have severe uh, COVID nineteen infection, and the others are mild and asymptomatic in healthcare worker in uh, Hasan Sadikin Hospital. In our study. Thank you, Amila. Thank you, Dr. Egi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anggi. Uh, Dr. Doni, please. Uh, sorry, um, I you mentioned about uh, around uh, fifty percent of the uh, healthcare worker got the uh, infection during study period. Uh, Is it? Right? No, uh, you mentioned that there were um, 124 healthcare workers uh, have a COVID infection during the study period. Right? In, yeah, yes, there is uh, 124 uh, people in uh, third search phase that have uh, COVID-19 infection. 
this is the survey uh, some the one in the uh, result the the infection is happen uh, between uh, third uh, between second survey to third mm -hmm. survey there are 124 person that have a covid-19 infection okay so uh, it was 22% in this first survey 9% in the second survey and uh, 37 in the third survey uh, how this correspond with the uh, COVID wave in Indonesia? Uh, because uh, uh, it's not clear here and whether this is more reflecting the epidemiology rather than uh, because uh, hospital is the specific uh, high risk uh, population. About the uh, COVID wave in Indonesia for. Mm -hmm. This study uh, that uh, first survey is conducted in July 2021 that happened a second outbreak in Indonesia with Delta variant. So uh, there are uh, about 35% uh, uh, that have COVID-19 infection in first survey. Uh, from this uh, time, uh, most of the participants are uh, Delta variant. And for the second survey, uh, in August 2021, uh, about 9% participant in COVID infection, also about uh, Delta variant. And for the third survey, uh, in August 2022, uh, most of participants are have COVID-19 infection uh, in uh, February 2022 in Omicron variant. Is this is the participant is the same participant, meaning it's a cohort, or is this it can be different participants? Uh, in participant is a, a, most of them are cohort participant. There is a, there is a participant that we uh, follow from the first survey until mm -hmm. third survey. But if there is a new participant uh, that uh, have survey in second survey, or there is new participant in third survey, we also include in this analysis data. Okay, because it would be good if we can have this cohort rather than the, the what you call, uh, a cross-sectional um, uh, analysis, because then you can see also uh, uh -huh. How many times those cohort will have a uh, reinfection, and also uh, whether those really uh, reflected in the uh, level of antibody in, in, in this individual person. So thank you. It, it is a very nice uh, presentation, and I give back to uh, moderator. Yeah, thank you, uh, Padoni. Uh, I think that we have uh, one audience uh, raise hand. Okay, uh, please, yeah. uh, Cipriano. Yeah, good to you. Uh, thank you, I'm Cipriano from Timor Leste, from Watery Timor Leste. So it's very, uh, so sorry, did you hear me? Yeah, very clear. Okay. But to back to the slide, the, uh, the slide before, it's uh, related to the statistical result from the uh, p value one. The, sorry, for the t square um, one. Oh, not, not, not this one. The, okay, this one. Yeah, I think um, the result is very interesting. So that, uh, yeah, oh yeah, uh, only occupational occupational doctor and non doctor it's have uh, the p value is have had the uh, very very significant and um, and here I'll talk about the male female and the other one comorbidity or to not uh, the significant but some uh, but uh, I think the theoretical sometimes maybe the, the comorbidity is more risk to the covid 19 you know? but in this research found that um uh, uh, like the uh, like diabetes also the comorbidity as well. So um, 
that's the question that um, this is the way I think in part of the, the statistical part, it's not significant, but uh, in the epidemiology aspect, it's really important. So how uh, the, uh, you are asked the resource, so uh, how you can communicate this or how you can think about it uh, uh, for the, this, this group, this very really risk as well in the epidemiologic aspect. Uh, thank you for the uh, question. Uh, in the study, we conduct study with a participant that have uh, age uh, about uh, 31 until 40 years old for uh, most of the participant about uh, 30 percent. So uh, for several st other study that show us that comorbidity uh, uh, participant with comorbid like hypertension or diabetes mellitus that have uh, high COVID-19 infection or have a lower antibody level is in a uh, participant with uh, old uh, participant above uh, above uh, 60 years old so uh, the median of age can influence the result of the study uh, because uh, in this study we medi median uh, age category uh, most of them are in 39 and 40 years old uh, this is different with other study uh, so uh, this study have lower uh, comorbid uh, participant uh, only for there is uh, 86 percent with hypertension about uh, 46 percent and for diabetes only 11 uh, participants so this uh, because uh, most of the participants are not have comorbid it can influence that comorbid uh, didn't have association with antibody level Okay, thank you for the response, uh, Amila. I think uh, it's enough, uh, Amila. We move to, because we have a very limited time, we move to the next presenter. Thank you and for all judges and committee. Thank you. Um, next presenter, Ben Hart, Christopher Simanjuntak. Do we have Ben Hart here? Okay. Uh, yes, Dr. Sure. You may start. Uh, let me share my screen first. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, good afternoon, honorable judges. Uh, my name is Ben Hart Siman Juntak from uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology Department, Nomen Senat KPB University, Medan, Indonesia. I'd like to present our research entitled Association Between COVID-19 Vaccination Status and Spontaneous Abortion in pregnant women. Uh, among the first of all countries that started uh, vaccination for pregnant women were America, which happened in the December 2020, uh, and then Indonesia uh, implemented their uh, vaccination in pregnant women started uh, from 2nd of August 2021. And as we know, COVID has more severe impact in pregnant women than non-pregnant women, and vaccination has been one of the way to encounter this issue. And vaccination has been also shown to reduce uh, risk of infection in uh, pregnant women, as shown is in one of these study in Israel uh, involving fifteen thousand pregnant women. And however, there was an issue about safety profiles of the vaccination in pregnant women, as one study from Dostal showed that uh, the prevalence of abortion in first trimester in pregnant women were around six point five percent. Although another study uh, showed that. This is still uh, with, within the normal range of the prevalence of abortion, uh, according to ACOG, with uh, below 10%. So it is necessary to carry out the further research regarding uh, this issue, especially in the uh, population of Indonesia. So our study is a cross-sectional study, uh, which carried out between March to June 2022 in private maternity clinic in Medan, Indonesia. Um, all of the pregnant women were vaccinated before uh, a preconception. So the inclusion criteria were women with either normal pregnancy or spontaneous abortion whose diagnosis were confirmed by the USG and knowing their COVID-19 vaccination status as shown by the certificate and they will to they are willing to participate for the uh, research or study. So. Okay, uh, we explained the research and offer uh, for the participants for the respondents to sign for consent. And then the respondents were interviewed 
and asked to fill up the questionnaire about the demographic data and they were undergoing a physical examination and USG to confirm the diagnosis. Their data were collected and analyzed with statistical analysis. Okay. So uh, around 319 uh, respondents enrolled in our study with 78% of them were in normal pregnancy. And amongst the normal pregnancy, there were 66% vaccinated and 12% uh, unvaccinated. And there were 22% of the respondents were uh, in spontaneous abortion. And amongst them, also there were 18% vaccinated and 4% unvaccinated. This is the demographic characteristic of the subjects uh, associated with the pregnant, pregnancy status. Uh, we found association between parity and uh, spontaneous abortion. Uh, and with the prevalence ratio there, uh, of three, uh, which means that uh, the pregnant woman, the multi para pregnant woman in our study is three times higher the probability to have a spontaneous abortion than the primi para. Okay. And our study also, sorry. And the majority of our study subjects also were in the healthy reproductive age of 20 to 35 years of age. And majority also in uh, premi para and the gestational age were less than eight weeks. Okay, uh, This is the demographic characteristics associated with the vaccination status of the subjects. And also we, find, uh, we found association between parity and vaccination status, uh, which uh, means that uh, the premi para in our study uh, having 1.8 times probability higher to be vaccinated than the multi para in our study. And this is the main result of our study. Uh, this is the association between the vaccination status and the uh, pregnancy status in our study. This data showed that uh, we found no association between COVID 19 vaccination status and the occurrence of spontaneous abortion in the pregnant woman. And this data support, supports the data from several previous studies that uh, the COVID-19 vaccination is not associated with several maternal outcomes, including the spontaneous abortion in other population. So to conclude, uh, our data uh, conclude once again that COVID-19 vaccination history was not associated with spontaneous abortion occurrence, uh, and thus adding the information regarding the COVID-19 safety profiles, especially in Indonesia. So thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bernard. Uh, I will start the questions uh, before other judges. Uh, Dr. Bernard, uh, maybe uh, for the background, uh, what do you think the correlation between the uh, vaccination, COVID vaccination to the even, that even in the pregnant woman. Thank you for the question, doctor. So COVID-19 vaccination in pregnant women uh, previously had some issues regarding to the safety profiles. And a couple of studies have shown that uh, there are some adverse effects, uh, adverse events uh, to, the matter, to the pregnant woman, but 90% of them were uh, not major adverse effects. So, like in common, uh, common adverse events like in non-pregnant uh, participants. But some studies uh, have shown that, uh, just like when I, in in my introduction, have reported that uh, there were some uh, there were a number of prevalence of abortion in their uh, uh, in their subjects, especially in the first trimester, if uh, the, the patient were. Uh, vaccinated in the first trimester. So, thank you, Doctor. Okay. Um, do you follow the the patient who did not have any abortion even? I mean, Sorry, for, do you follow the 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 neonates born born from this uh, mother? Oh, okay. So uh, we didn't follow the neonatal outcomes uh, from these uh, respondents. We just uh, did the cross-sectional study and interviewed at that time only. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Doni, 
Dr. Yeah. Doni, please, yes. Thank you very much. This is, I think, a very interesting and important study. Um, I'm a bit confused with the term you use uh, for comparison because uh, normal pregnancy is a, a condition, but the spontaneous abortion is uh, one of the outcome of normal pregnancy. So I, I as if it, this is not a, a comparable uh, groups uh, for me. So um, I, I have I need to clarify. So what you do is you you uh, recruit uh, pregnant women, and then some of them you have uh, already with the uh, abortion. And then some of them still in the pregnancy. Is it correct? Uh, we directly interviewed the uh, respondents, doctor, uh, when they came. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the recruitment process is that uh, I mean, you recruit those who already have uh, abortion and those who are still in a pregnancy. Uh, we directly interviewed them uh, mm -hmm. on the time for examination. Uh, at that time, so we we did not follow any uh, any time. Okay. Did not... So no, it's just that uh, when you recruit a, a participant with the abortion, it means they already have a, a pregnancy outcome, which is abortion, right? And yes. uh, the other one uh, is still. In the pregnancy, we don't know the outcome. Is it is it correct? So we, we don't know whether at the end of the day they will also have an abortion or other uh, oh, outcome, okay. uh, pregnancy outcomes. The normal pregnancy subjects actually we we follow them, doctor. Sorry. So we okay. follow the normal pregnancy subjects until twenty weeks, and then uh, we clarify that they didn't have abortion. Okay, but there's also no other, uh, as uh, Dr. Eki uh, question, there, there were no other follow-up leading to the outcome of the pregnancy. Okay, okay so I, I think um, it, it should be uh, a bit clear in this presentation. And the second one is that uh, there are three times increased of those who uh, uh, between primitive para and multi para, but uh, which one is the reference group? Is it the multi para or, or the primi para? The primi para, doctor. The... Eh, so, sorry, for the spontaneous abortion, uh, three times uh, higher probability in the multi para. In the multi para, the... okay. What do you think will be the explanation for this? Sorry, Doctor. What do you think is the possible explanation for this? Oh, uh, as we know, spontaneous abortion has uh, some uh, risk factors. Uh, one of them is uh, multigravida and uh, multipara. And when they have... Uh, uh, when they uh, have higher uh, number of multipara and multigravida, they also have some numbers of uh, comorbidities as well. Uh, okay. And what will be your recommendation for the government? Uh, regarding to the multiparity, doctor. Uh, regarding to the findings of your study. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, so our recommendation is that uh, the government should continue more, should continue the vaccination in the pregnant woman in Indonesia. Uh, so the coverage is uh, higher and higher and all of the uh, pregnant women which, uh, will be safe. Mm -hmm. And uh, regarding the pregnant woman? Oh, uh, so the... Our recommendation is that uh, all the pregnant women should, shouldn't be uh, afraid to take the vaccines because there were 
some issues around uh, safety profiles of the vaccination and one of the most concerning events were about the abortion and this study uh, confirmed that uh, it didn't associate between the vaccination of COVID-19 and in, in the occurrence of abortion. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask one short question to Bernard. Bernard, uh, please show the your second slide. Yeah. Uh, it showed that a third. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, your slide. Uh, yes. There's the range normal prevalence of abortion, uh, which is below ten percent. It's very interested in because in your uh, data you get eighteen percent or more than ten percent of uh vaccinated pregnant women get abortion baby later. Of course, in, in a, while you analyze your data, uh, the result non-significant, but what uh, do you, uh, what's your comment about that? That uh, the abortion more than 10% or more than the normal range of abortion prevalence? Thank you for the question, doctor. Uh, regarding to this issue, I have also uh, looked for another reference, actually, for the normal prevalence of abortion. And in what I cited in this study were the population of America. So they uh, justified the results based on their population. And I, I looked up at some other uh, reference that some of them said that uh, the prevalence were 10 to 18 percent. So uh, I think it's still uh, in the range of the. Uh, the abortion level in Indonesia, the incidence of abortion in Indonesia. Sorry, but uh, in Indonesia, I I haven't uh, looked up for it yet, uh, doctor. So. Okay, so it's better to use yeah. Indonesian data. Uh, yeah. for background. Thank you, Dr. Angi. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Angi, and thank you, Dr. Bermat, for the nice response. Uh, we still have uh, maybe one minute, one or two minutes. Uh, I invited um, question or comments from participants. You may raise hand. If there's no comment or question from participants, thank you, Dr. Bernard, uh, for a nice presentation. Um, for the next speakers, uh, we will have uh, Stephanie Chandra. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Yes, please. Time's yours. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Egi and other judges. Uh, this is a great pleasure and great opportunity for us to present our research study about asinetobacter bomanico infection in severe COVID-19 patient in Wongsonegoro Hospital ICU. My name is Stephanie Chandra Firmanti and my colleague Salma Olia. We are from Faculty of Medicine, Diponegoro University. The background of our study Prevalence of bacterial co-infection in COVID-19 patient in hospitalized and attributed with ICU admission was higher if we compare with COVID-19 patient that hospitalized without attributed with ICU admission. And Asinetobacter bomani co-infection is one of the most common cause causative of pathogen that make uh, nosocomial infection especially in ICU, and then the prevalence, incidence of the prevalence asinetobacter bomani increase over time. And this, uh, in this, my, uh, in my screen, we can see the review about incidence of co-infection and secondary infection of asinetobacter bomani during COVID-19 pandemic that reported from various countries. From this review, we can, 
we can see that prevalence of acinetobacter baumannicola infection have wide range of prevalence from 1% until 90%. And the following study also reveal about a tendency of increasing of proportion of acinetobacter baumannicola infection in ICU patient during COVID-19 pandemic compared to before pandemic. And the problem when patient infected by Acinetobacter baumani is uh, Acinetobacter baumani has characteristic that is um, intrinsically resistant to almost all antibiotic. So we, uh, when we treated this infection, uh, make it very limited therapy to treat this infection. And for uh, until now, there is still limited data about bacterial co-infection in COVID-19 uh, patient, especially in Indonesia. And for your information, Wongsonogoro Hospital is one of COVID-19 referral hospital in Semarang. So we thought that this study is so important. So the objective of this study is to determine the prevalence and then bacterial susceptibility profile and treatment option for acinetobacter baumannicola infection in COVID-19 patient treated at Wongsonogoro Hospital ICU. For the methods, uh, we perform descriptive retrospective study in uh, ICU Wongsonogoro Hospital from June 2020 to September 2021 by electronic medical records. And for the inclusion criteria, patient confirmed to be infected SARS-CoV-2 by RT-PCR and the age of patient greater than or equals to 18 years old, and patient perform culture and antibiotic susceptibility testing. For the result, we got prevalence of bacterial co-infection in severe COVID-19 patient that uh, admitted to Wongsonogoro Hospital ICU was 57.2% with Acinetobacter baumani dominated about 15%. And the antibiogram profile from Acinetobacter baumani, we can see here that Acinetobacter baumani showed totally resistance to ampicillin, astronam, and cefasolin. And almost all antibiotics, um, Acinetobacter baumani highly resistant yeah, to almost all antibiotics. Only uh, trimetropin sofametaxasol that seems to be sensitive and the sensitivity only 55.9%. And we also got data about XDR prevalence of Acinetobacter baumani, 83.87% and MGR prevalence of Acinetobacter baumani, 4.3%. So uh, we identified a higher level of bacterial co-infection among ICU admitted COVID-19 patients. This is in line with a few studies before. The most causative identified co-infected bacteria is Acinetobacter baumani, followed by other escape microorganisms and widely used ventilator and catheter, also prolonged hospitalization in the ICU, uh, well-known risk factor for Acinetobacter baumani infection. And then the use of corticosteroid and anti interleukin 6 directed therapies in COVID-19 positive patient suppresses the immune system and causes a high incidence of microbial co-infection. And um, high prevalence of XDR and MDR in our patients related to the characteristic of Acinetobacter baumani that are intrinsically resistant to almost all antibiotics. And uh, this is, can be induced by inappropriate use of antibiotics as part of COVID-19 treatment. And Acinetobacter baumani has developed three basic properties to perfectly adapt to current healthcare settings. The first is ability of Acinetobacter baumani to colonize skin, mucous membrane, and devices, and survive in the hospital environment. And ability to express multiple virulence factor, also extensive resistance to antimicrobial agent to enzymatic modification of antibiotics, uh, target gene mutation, Outer outer membrane permeability and upregulated multi-track efflux pumps. So um, early recognition, stringent infection control measures, 
raise awareness for acinetobacter baumani infection should be strengthened and focus research and development of new antibiotics for PDR, um, XGR, or MGR of acinetobacter baumani are increasingly urgent. For the conclusion, the, uh, the prevalence of bacterial co-infection was high in COVID-19 patients treated in the ICU Wongsenogoro Hospital. Acinetobacter baumani was the highest causative agent of bacterial co-infection, and almost no antibiotics are effective against acinetobacter baumani infection other than trimetoprim sulfur metatoxol with suboptimal sensitivity. So the discovery of new drugs and treatment protocols for acinetobacter baumani infection, especially in severe COVID-19 patient, is very urgent. Uh, we thank to director, medical record department, microbiology laboratory, and also clinical microbiologist of Wongsenegoro Hospital. I think that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Stephanie. Very sharp. Uh, time management, very good. Uh, Dr. Anggi, may I have your question first? Thank you, Dr. Anggi. It's very uh, interested in uh, study. If the patient came with uh, from community or hospital, uh, from, uh, another hospital, the patients? Thank you, uh, Dr. Anggraini. We don't have data about that. Uh, so in this... In the study, we we not differentiate between co-infection, bacterial co-infection, and secondary infection. So you do know that whether the patient from community or another yeah. hospital. Yes, yes. And how long after? Uh, how long after the patient stay at the ICU and you got a blood culture for acinetobacter baumani? Uh. There was various various time, doctor. Yes. And uh, is it after um, the patient? The, the yeah. patient get ceftriaxone first because we know almost uh all patients with COVID nineteen uh have uh ceftriaxone for the first line antibiotic. I'm sorry. Is the patient have already got ceftriaxone first? After uh, while he got acinetobacter baumani result? Uh, there's also various various condition. So we, we perform culture when there is a clinical manifestation of patient that uh, refers to there there is a co-infection, yeah, co-infection like pneumonia or bloodstream infection or the other. Okay, it's very interesting in if you put those data because you have uh, more than 80% of XDR patients. Yes. So it's very important uh, to know whether the patient uh, have a, a refer from another hospital or from the community, and also uh, whether the patient have already got any antibiotics treatment. Yes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Egi. Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Anggi. Dr. Doni? May I have your question? Thank you very much. I think this is also a very important and interesting study, uh, particularly uh, I think it will also influence the outcome of the uh, COVID-19. But I, I wonder uh, whether in your study you also try to see uh, what will be the out what was the outcome of those who has this uh, uh, bacteria infection and others, and whether there is a uh, different rates in the outcome, particularly perhaps severity or mortality, when you have these different, uh, I don't know, uh, either co-infection or secondary infection. You have that data? Yes, we have, but uh, this is uh, primary data, so we can uh, we cannot disseminate today. Okay. But it, it will be very important if you can also have that. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, because one of the, your inclusion criteria is that a uh, patient who has this culture and drug sensitivity testing, and whether there are a, a, a certain proportion of the patient with my uh, clinically have a bacterial infection, but they don't get... Uh, they did not get the culture uh, and also uh, drug sensitivity testing, uh, how big they are. And perhaps this also 
may influence whether the your prevalence is uh, underestimated or not. Sorry, doctor, I don't get it. No, I mean, um, in your inclusion criteria, you mentioned that uh, uh, the data included is, is of those patients who got uh, culture and also drug sensitivity testing, right? Um, but uh, perhaps there are uh, uh, patients who clinically uh, considered as has some bacterial infection, but without uh, culture uh, examination and also drug sensitivity testing, how big they are, if there's any, because this may uh, influence the estimation of the prevalence from your studies. Yeah, maybe it can uh, be limitation for our study. Uh, mm -hmm. if there are patients that clinically bacterial infection clinically, but uh, the doctor not not refer to clinical uh, microbiology laboratory to do culture and AST. Uh, uh, do you have the the numbers how big they are uh, approximately? No, we don't have. Okay, last question. What are your recommendation? Because I, I think this is a, a, a use and it's quite terrifying to have those uh, uh, extremely drug resistant uh, bacteria in your hospital. Okay, um, this is not, not my hospital, Doc. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, maybe we have to. Uh, increase our awareness, yeah, and increasing our infection control measure, of course. Okay, thank you, Dr. Agi. Back to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Doni. Uh, Dr. Stephanie, very nice uh, presentation. Uh, but I realized that your ICU, of course, this is not your ICU, but in your in your uh, study. In, in the ICU, the prevalence before the prevalence before COVID nineteen break is already high for the prevalence for uh, Asinatobacter baumanai, right? Sorry, uh, sorry, doctor, uh, we don't we don't know about the data. Oh. I only uh, used the review before. Oh, okay, okay. So, I mean that. Do you because we know that in ICU or uh, on PICU uh, the the prevalence of uh, acetonomo acinetobacter baumannii is very high. So do you think that your result is because of previously it is already high there, existingly high? Maybe, maybe it can. Yeah. Yes, yes, I believe it can be. So I think the, the comment from Dr. Angi before is very important. We have to know uh, the history of the patient. I mean, if there is a, uh, if there are a referral from other hospital or it is the first hospital they attended to, okay, so it is very important. So I think uh, if you have data, it, it, it will be very good for your uh, publication next step. And the second question, um, can you explain about the mechanism uh, underlying of this co-infection between bacterial and viral infection? Because of COVID uh, caused by virus, right? And then uh, I said no, but was bacterium. So is that any specific mechanism uh, underlying that co-infection? Yeah, uh, we know that um, COVID-19 may damage yeah, in our respiratory tract. And then um, we know that infection uh, to, what's that? Uh, sorry, can I speak in Bahasa? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, untuk membuat infeksi, untuk membuat terjadinya infeksi biasanya harus ada tiga hal yang um, apa namanya me memungkinkan infeksi itu terjadi baik dari hostnya, kemudian agennya maupun dari lingkungannya. Nah, dengan adanya COVID-19 itu um, membuat 
hostnya bermasalah dari apa namanya dari traktus respiratorisnya sendiri dia terjadi kerusakan kemudian dari agennya sendiri di sini Acinetobacter boemani dia dengan multiple virulent faktor ya yeah. membuatnya bisa melekat kemudian menginvasi kemudian dia juga bisa bebas dari fagositosis gitu ya dan dengan berbagai uh, faktor yang membuat dia ini resisten terhadap berbagai macam antibiotik gitu ya uh, mempermudah Acinetobacter boemani ini menginfeksi kemudian selain itu di lingkungannya sendiri Um, apa namanya dalam kondisi ICU ya seperti ICU uh, sangat mungkin sekali paparan uh, bakteri itu ada di ICU bisa dari pekerjanya kemudian dari fomites kemudian dari pasien-pasien sebelumnya itu dokter Egi I'm sorry okay. Oh, no, it's okay. Nice, a nice um, response. Thank you, thank you. Because we have a uh, limited time, very interesting topics. Um, we can continue discussion later. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Stephanie. Yes, very interesting, right, Dr. Yes, Angie? Correct. Uh, may I have just one question? Uh, okay, short so, question. Yes, please. Short question. Yes. Um, it's very interested in why Acinetobacter baumani is the highest uh bacteria. In your PICU. <laughs> um, belum bisa menjawab dokter. Uh, kami butuh penelitian yeah. lebih lanjut ya. Kami butuh penelitian yeah. lebih lanjut. Kenapa menjadi uh, terjadi perubahan? Ya, yeah. ya, yeah, yeah, yeah. Termasuk juga dengan penggunaan septiaktor itu yang bikin tekan. <laughs> yeah. Terima kasih, Dr. Stephanie. Thank you, Dr. Stephanie. Um, Okay, we move to the next presenter, uh, Nanda Putri. Yes, uh, good afternoon all judges and participants. My name is Nanda, I'm from Bandung. Uh, let me share my screen first. Yeah, uh, let me, uh, I want to present my research about Sinovac vaccine and presence of Amode SARS-CoV-2 SRBD antibody level prevented death among hospitalized patients in Dr. Hassan Sadikin Hospital, Bandung. Uh, as a background, uh, mortality uh, in Indonesia, especially in low-income countries, the mortality uh, caused by COVID is very high, especially in uh, patient aged more than 60 years old, comorbid more than two, and then a severe degree of disease severity. Uh, increasing cases so uh, similar with uh, increasing the mortality is it any prevention we can do so we can do we do that like vaccination and then the passive immunization that we help uh, that is can make from the, that the antibody after the antibody from we would like to know that is it any antibody level that has uh, been uh, uh, post exposure or post vaccination that antibody level is it can giving any uh, protective effect or can reduce the death rate? And how about the outcome? And how about this incident in uh, Hassan Sadikin Hospital as the largest referral uh, hospital in West Java? This study is a retrospective cohort study that data were collected from hospitalized patients were confirmed for COVID-19 from March 2021 and until May 2022 with the inclusion criteria are uh, patient aged more than 18 years old, positive for PCR SARS-CoV-2, and then hospitalized patient diagnosed with confirmed COVID-19, and then testing for SARS-CoV-2 antibody was carried out at the first start of the treatment. And for the exclusion criteria are patients who have received monoclonal antibody and convalescent plasma therapy before treatment and patients who died in less than 48 hours in hospital care. Uh, this statistical analysis for the uh, basic characteristic we process with bifurate analysis and then for the result we process with categoric correlative bifurate analysis with CHI and Freezer test. And then we using ROC for determine the cutoff point of antibody level. And then um, for the result, from March 2021 until May 2022, we collected total sample of 160 patients and uh, got 180 patients fulfilled the requirements uh, based on the inclusion of the analysis. As the result, we can see that the outcome from this study is uh, uh, 24.6% patient are deaf and 75% patient are survived. Most of 
uh, most of uh, patients died uh, aged more than 60 years old, as much as 31%. And then most of them uh, have a more comorbidity more than two, and hypertension is the most common comorbid. And then this is in line with the research that has been conducted by Luo said that comorbidities increasing the risk of death of COVID-19. And then for the green one, we can see that the disease severity that is uh, super critical, the outcome uh, show that a significant, uh, significantly higher proportion of that patient in severe crit critically ill compared to mass severity. And then the red line, we can see that this is about the number of that uh, was higher and statistically significant in patients who had never been vaccinated. And then we can see in the blue line that uh, in patients who had uh, been vaccinated with two doses, the proportion of that was lower than those who had only one dose vaccine or who had not been vaccinated at all. This is a table about distribution of antibody based on age, disease severity, vaccination, and outcome. We can see the red line that uh, the antibody level of SARS-CoV-2 uh, RBD were higher in survived patients and then uh, then in the disease patient and then this is statistically significant and for the blue line we can see that subject uh, who received the vaccination with the moderate severity and age uh, 18 until 42 years old uh, had higher levels of uh, antibody level and then uh, those who did not receive the vaccination. This is the table about the cut off value uh, of antibody level on the mortality after the calculation. We have the uh, cut off value 181. This is, uh, means that predicting mortality has very good accuracy result, then this is acceptable. This is the table about the effect of uh, vaccination on mortality. We can see that a uh, patient or subject who only got one dosis or one vaccine, the protective effect to death is uh, 72%. But in patient who got full doses or two doses, uh, the effect of protective effect is higher, uh, 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 eight, uh, 81%. And then for the patient who, who has the antibody level more than 181, uh, that is uh, have the protective effect against the death was uh, 56%. And then this is uh, statistically significant. This is the table about the relationship uh, of other risk factor on mortality. This, uh, about, uh, even though in this research that is uh, more than 60 years old is not significantly, but this is in line with the research that has been conducted by, by Young at all. They said that there is no significant difference between SARS-CoV-2 antibody levels on age and mortality. Uh, and this research is uh, find that a patient who uh, severe or critical case can increase the risk of death by 9.5 times. And then this research also conducted that that vaccinated can reduce the risk of death by 69.9%. And then for the antibody level more than 181, it means that can protect uh, as much as uh, 68% against the risk of death. And this is similar with the uh, research uh, conducted by fit the FITO. They said that antibodies, which is, is high at the start of the treatment, uh, provide a protective effect and reduce mortality. So. Uh, uh, the conclusions are, uh, this study confirms that Sinovac vaccine has a good efficacy to prevent death among hospitalized patients, and then having a modest level of SARS-CoV-2 RBD at the beginning of hospitalization can reduce the mortality rate of COVID-19 patients, and then it is necessary to implement uh, SARS-CoV-2 RBD antibody testing in a COVID-19 treatment protocol as it has a prognosis and this is a value. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nanda. Uh, Dr. Nanda. Uh, Dr. Anggi, may I? Yes, Dr. Nanda. Uh, Nanda, uh, you have a very good um, result of a uh, Sinovac vaccine. I guess it is, it's the Delta. Uh, is that correct? On Delta and Alpha? Yes. Alpha and yes, Delta. Uh, sorry. If um, you mention about the uh, death rate, um, how about the death rate of uh, elderly 
is it uh, also protect by Sinovac vaccine? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your uh, for your question, Dr. Anggi. So for the elderly, uh, who uh, in this this uh, this research is checking for the first and the second wave by the Delta. Uh, for the elderly, we have a lot of patients with elderly who age more than sixty years old. Uh, most of all, the patient in this um uh, the patient in this uh, research is not all vaccinated. And then the elderly in this uh, uh, research is have more than one comorbidity. So most of all, the elderly is not protected because they did not uh, get the vaccinated yet. But there are some uh, some elderly who got the vaccine, only one dosis, but uh, they can survive. Thank you, Dr. Egi. Thank you, Dr. Anggi. Uh, Dr. Doni? Um, thank you very much, Dr. Angi. I, I, I would like to follow up uh, Dr. Angi's questions. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Angi, a question about uh, the age uh, and the elderly. Uh, have you controlled the age? Uh, because uh, I I don't know the 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 if you if you can stratify because we we see that the elderly has a higher risk for uh, severity and death. On the other hand, uh, elderly also has a lower uh, vaccination rate because of those uh, things, uh, particularly in the uh, early uh, vaccination campaign. So. How how do you control or uh, uh, estimate the effect of uh, this age uh, to the outcome of those so that you can see whether this is really about the vaccine uh, or this is really uh, because most of the uh, elderly which has more comorbidity uh, without a uh, vaccine, that's why they are higher. Rather than the younger, uh, they are they have, uh, they have a lower risk and they have vaccine. So you 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 see the the question. Yes, uh, Doctor Doni, thank you for your question. Uh, first of all, uh, how we uh, spare the age for elderly? Why we use sixty years old? Because in our uh in our place that uh, elderly is, uh, we call it geriatric, it start uh, when age 60 years old, more than mm -hmm. 60 years old. And then why uh, in this study, uh, elderly is uh, low get the vaccinated? Because for the first, uh, first vaccinated, we, uh, West Java, of course, we ask our public to get vaccinated, but there are still a uh, huge rumor. If we got vaccinated, you will get COVID or you will get sick. So that, uh, and then the, the son or the, uh, the children cannot uh, bring the, uh, uh, the parents to the uh, uh, vaccinated facility. So the, the, first, uh, the first problem. And then the second problem, uh, uh, elderly people is uh, always uh, have uh, more than two comorbidities, and then uh, that comorbidities also can uh, makes the uh, makes the progressivity of the of the uh, disease is more severe. But we have uh, we we also have the elderly who got the full vaccinated, uh, even though the, the elderly have more than comorbidity, at least they can survive from the COVID uh, if they come uh, to us in early uh, in early stage. So the we can uh, we can um, we can prevent the progressive progressive of the uh, disease, but. If the elderly come to us, uh, even though they have on uh, two vaccine and come to us late, we cannot uh, prevent that. So that uh, that's why the uh, mortality in elderly is very high. Yeah. Um, uh, do you have any intention to because I I see this as more like a cross cross sectional study rather than the cohort. You you don't have the the uh, uh, 
time dependent variable included in the analysis. So my suggestion, perhaps you can look into this as a case control study in, uh, comparing the deaf and the non-deaf patient and then see the the uh, exposure of COVID-19 vaccine and also match into the age group and also comorbidity. So that you can also have a clearly uh, controlled those things so that you uh, may, uh, what you call, um, can see that all, uh, because uh, it's matched with the uh, age group and also morbidity, it's only the vaccine that differentiate the, the, the outcome of the study. What do you think? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Dani. Actually, that is one of our research limitation because the design of this study was an observational retrospective analysis. So the strength of the relationship between the variables and uh, what uh, is lower than the case control or cohort. So I think for the further, we need to uh, make another analysis or uh, research uh, for a study. Okay, thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Doni. I, I have a short a short question and first uh, confirmation. Uh, all of your study participants uh, had vaccination with a Sinovac or is there any other vaccine? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Eggy. This is uh, our, all of my particip participant is a public and they are only uh, had Sinovac, no other than that, only Sinovac. For the first and the second dose, only Sinovac. Uh, there is no other vaccine than Sinovac. Okay, thank you. And the question is, um, I mean, uh, how how you hear that the 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 mortality is uh, the relationship uh, between uh, those who already vaccinated with the higher level of uh, antibody titer because yeah. you know uh, geriatry usually had the very low response of vaccination that's why we need to boost them right yeah but the response is not as better as uh, as good as the uh, other group of age what do you think yeah thank you doctor uh, i think that uh, uh how about the high uh, high level antibody in the first treatments uh, is depend on how the uh, condition of its uh, age. Uh, uh, unfortunately, in elderly, we didn't in our uh, research in our data we didn't get uh, the high antibody level. Uh, beside elderly for the immunocompromised patient like uh, lupus. And then, like TB or someone uh, or patient like uh, hepatic cirrhosis, they cannot have a high level of antibody. But uh, most of our uh, uh, of our research, uh, there are uh, age for uh, age from eighteen until forty two. Uh, that is young uh, young people and very healthy. They have a high level antibody, and then they are uh, with that comorbidity. Okay. 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 Thank. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nanda Putri. Um, we still have two presenters. Uh, now we move to the next presenters. Presenter, uh, Vega Visesa Setia Budi. Um. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Egi. I will share my screen now. Okay. So, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon to um, Dr. Egi, Dr. Anggraini, and Dr. Doni, as well as everyone uh, in the committee for making this possible. And today I'm going to talk about um, our findings in the COVID Life Study, the project that I'm currently running, where we use a different SARS-CoV-2 serological assays in our seroprevalence analysis. A uh, little bit of a study background. Uh, the main thing for COVID Life Study is, first and foremost, it's a household transmission study. So we recruit households in the Liverpool city region uh, from July to September 2020, and we managed to get 434 participants 
And we asked all of the participants to conduct a weekly um, self-swabbing where we analyze for SARS-CoV-2 um, analysis or infection. But more importantly for uh, this presentation, uh, we ask uh, participants or we check the participants' uh, serological status upon baseline or upon enrollment, as well as uh, at the end of the observational period at the end of the 12th week, where each corresponds to um, indicating exposure history before uh, and <laughs> during the study enrollment. Um, a little bit of the why we do seroprevalence analysis. First thing first, um, I think not all pathogens are the same. Some pathogens, uh, the serological signals indicate a good exposure like measles, and they also indicate a lifelong protection immunity like the measles rubella or smallpox. But others are not great. Like for example, uh, HIV, malaria, and TB, they elicit different serological response depending on different stages of disease. So it's not a really good signal of exposure. But for SARS-CoV-2 itself, um, seroprevalence analysis is good for um, estimating the extent of disease spread in the population because not all cases have um, specific symptoms or many of them are asymptomatic. So that's why we need a better, better diagnosis to, um, to check the prevalence in the, or the, uh, the extent of disease in the population. We could also use it to estimate the infection fatality rate as opposed to case fatality rate, as the case fatality rate is highly influenced by case assertment bias, as explained previously. Another point is we could measure the dynamic population level of immunity and susceptibility to exposure from infection, vaccination, or both. If you could see from the, um, from the interactive graph here, this is the um, anti-S antibody data from the England English population and the, the percentage corresponds to the seropositive proportion uh, at different time points. And this correlates with not only, the, not only how disease spread, but also how the UK government are um, managing its vaccination. If you could see later on, uh, the seropositive proportion are highest in the el elderly population just because the, the UK government prioritized them for boosters. So back to the study again, these are the three serological assays that we use. The Fortress uh, is a COVID-19 IG, COVID IgG rapid test, a qualitative lateral flow immunoassay. The Omega is a semi-quantitative ELISA, um, detecting IgG uh, SARS-CoV-2 as uh, an N antigen. And lastly, it's the MSD, which is a quantitative multiplex immunoassay, uh, detecting the SNN antigen, and we use a predetermined cutoff point to indicate zero positivity for this uh, for the MSD. A little bit of a background for the study timeline here. So um, the squiggly line there indicates the uh, daily new cases in the Liverpool city region. The blue line indicates study milestones, and the red line indicates government measures such as lockdowns. If you could see here, uh, at the from first July up, up until October uh, is the study enrollment period, and after that, we follow up participants up until February 2021, but most of them are already follow up within, within the mid-January, around the time point of the um, alpha wave, a uh, very alpha variant wave in, the, in, in Liverpool. So this is the analyzable study participants. So from, from 134 participants, only 203 participants um, have complete serological status from all three assays. And if you notice here, we don't have any children, unfortunately, because children are only finger prick blood spot samples. We only took off blood spot samples from them, whilst the MSD requires a genus blood of either serum or plasma. And this is the result. So if you only focus on the baseline, the seropositive proportion are quite, the discrepancy are quite high. The, the first and second bar graph uh, is the fortress and MSD. It more or less corresponds to a similar result. But the omega is very, very high. It's more than 30%, which if we measure or we compare to other population, it actually corresponds to a higher risk healthcare workers, which we don't think is feasible or it's, it's explainable. Why do we have a community or why, why is our study population is as high risk to get exposed to SARS-CoV-2 as other healthcare workers? So that's why we did the other two studies. And the last graph there is the ONS infection survey where the UK government did a random survey of the people uh, to check the seropositivity, but we would expect it to be lower because it consists of um, all urban and rural population, whilst our study population are mostly urban. 
as can be seen here, the agreement between assays are um, very different. If you could see in the baseline, especially the omega, uh, it has a 58.5% zero positive that, is, that does not correspond to either Fortress of or MSD. It gets a bit lower uh, at follow up or ever zero positive at 38.5 there, but it's still quite high and much higher than the other two assays. And here are the agreement between assays for the Kappa statistics. The, the red line there I indicate is the best one that we have, which as you might expect, does not involve the omega. It's only Fortress at an MSD where they have moderate agreement. But for the omega and the other two assays, the Kappa statistic agreement ranges between 0.09 until 0.17, which is very slight or even poor, I would say. So in conclusion, Reported assay performance has been very variable from what the manufacturer claim. The manufacturer might claim that the sensitivity and specificity is above 95 or 98%, but unfortunately that's not what we found. Even though this is not really a uh, sensitivity and specificity uh, uh, testing of the assays, but we have a reasonable belief that the omega does not really correspond to what the seropositive population is in our study population. So that's why independent assay validation before doing a seroprevalence survey, we think that it is very important. If we could have confirmed positive sample, compare it to pre-pandemic samples as a true negative, we could uh, measure the sensitivity and specificity independently. But we would also need to, do, to, uh, to uh, take point of the potential of cross-reactivity with other endemic pathogens like dengue. Consideration of the strength and limitation of each assays needs to be uh, weighed as well, because the MSD, even though it it gets a uh, quantifiable result. It's very, ex it's quite expensive compared to the other two assays. So just as an, as an example here, each dots represent each participants at uh, different time points and the line corresponds to the uh, participants result at the follow-up time point. So as you can see here, this is what the MSD offers. It offers a, the quantifiable measurement that at baseline, either spike or nucleocapsid, it gets higher uh, when the result is compared with follow-up. In it indicating there are exposure during the study enrollment. Okay, that's all uh, for me. And these are all the references that I use. Uh, if you want to read more about the COVID lift study, we have published our study protocol as well as a sub study where we investigate the SARS CoV 2 fecal shedding in the community. I have to mention the old of COVID lift study group here. It's a truly really collaborative process from many different people, many different groups from across universities. And these are our funders, the NIHR, HPRU, CIDR, and Alder H Charity. And last but not least, I would like to acknowledge LPDP for funding my PhD. And for the in the University of Liverpool, I would like to thank my primary supervisors and collaborators. And I was supposed to do my initial for PhD project in Jakarta in Gajah Mada, but unfortunately COVID happened, but I, I need to change a uh, whole project to the COVID. But I'm still very grateful for all the discussion that I had with the people there. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Oiga. Very, very nice presentation. And um, maybe I will uh, go first with my comments. Um, it is not, actually, it is not the question. It is more to confirmation. For your study participant, do you have the similarity of the uh, epidemiology characteristic? Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Agi, similarity to compare to? Um, um, those uh, with those um, tools, with different tools, do you have the similar uh, characteristic as epidemiology? For example, um, you said that it is most uh, lived in the rural area and then so on. Do you have the similar uh, right. characteristic? Um, so, Compared to the general population of Liverpool, uh, Liverpool city region comprised of six um, areas, and all of them are urban. So it's it quite corresponds to what we um, to what we found in our study populations. But also, um, the age. Um, I think uh, I mentioned a bit that it's uh, we only have adult that, and also the elderly population are quite high, as expected in a developed world, or developed countries where the elderly population. So. It's quite representative, but unfortunately, we just don't have the children population in our analysis here. Yeah, this uh, my question is the next question is about the children, but yeah, okay, you don't have that uh, data. Um, and the, the next question, so you have the comparable comparable data, right? Comparable between those results come from the um, uh, 
those four different tools. So I don't know, uh, based on your experience or um, competency, do you have any uh, any reference? Uh, I mean, you recommend one of those uh, tools. <laughs> Um, well, MSD offers a very, a very flexible rather than you just, uh, would you just say that it's zero positive or not? It offers a quantifiable measurement, which is very, I think it's very, um, it, it affords, um, other statistical analysis to be, to be done rather than just a binary positive or negative. And, um, if I'm not mistaken, there was a publication from the modern, modern Omicron booster study released a couple of days ago. And they also use the MSD, which is quite reassuring um, to say, to say the least, um, that it has been used with uh, with other publications. Thank you. Maybe let, uh, the 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 next question will be the cost, but I will not ask that. <laughs> okay, uh, Doctor Angie, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Uiga. It's very interested in uh, uh, study uh, regarding. Uh, COVID-19 antibody check in Indonesia. What do you comment about that first? Because it's, uh, maybe it's a, a different uh, manufacturer uh, to check the antibody. And what do you think the, about the zero prevalence, uh, your, uh, especially your study? Uh, is it before vaccination, uh, mass vaccination of COVID-19? And how to um, differentiate uh, the antibody uh, one with just from uh, the infected uh, by SARS-CoV-2 and others maybe infected or maybe vaccinated or both. Uh, and after you you have um a holistic uh, uh, result, what is the set of protection or the number of sort of set of protection for people uh, not to get uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection? Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Angraini. Uh, sorry, let me just, I'm just taking notes of your questions here. Um, yeah. So I think there are quite a few studies, if I'm not mistaken, uh, of zero prevalence in Indonesia. There are some in, in, in Jakarta, in, in Surabaya, but all of them are across different time points. And if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Doni also released a uh, preprint study not long ago on zero prevalence in Bantul, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Doni. So um, uh, it's it's quite interesting, but, uh, and also uh, just to, to, um, to touch a bit on your second question, Dr. Angraini, uh, differentiation between uh, infection and vaccination, it's a bit easier here in the UK just because they use the vaccines that they use only elicits a uh, spike antibodies, uh, antibodies to the spike antigen, I mean, uh, because they use the Pfizer as well as the AstraZeneca or the Moderna. Whilst the inactivated vaccines of Sinovac, it's, it's a bit tricky to, to tell whether this antibody uh, comes from infection or vaccination because they use inactivated vaccines, so they use the whole component of the vaccines. So if we find someone uh, in the UK, for example, that got vaccinated there, and then they only have spike and uh, spike antibody, we might indicate or presume that it's come it's coming from vaccination. But if they have the N or the nuclear capsid uh, antibody, uh, we might assume that it's from exposure from infection. So um, it's uh, it's a bit tricky, I guess, to other places, but yeah, but it's it's still a very interesting question and it's very interesting to answer if we could differentiate uh, immunity from infection and vaccination or even both. Um, so um, I think that's all. Is, is that is, does that does that Mara's, answer my your yeah. question? Sorry. Sorry, last <laughs> question. I, I, I forgot. Um, 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 um uh, the the set of protection. Yeah. All right. Me. Sorry. Um, I don't think um, our study could answer that. Um, so we, uh, we, we, we measure the, the household transmission study, but we, we don't really uh, measure the zero protection of, of, the, um, 
uh, from infection, uh, especially. But I think if we could expand this more, if we could use the MSD to, to use a, a more representative or a more correlate of protection of antibody, especially to anti-RBD, it probably uh, it could, could probably tell us a more compelling story of how it protects against infections or even severe infect or even severe uh, manifestation. But unfortunately, I don't think we we could answer that, uh, especially here. Sorry. Thank you, Ega. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Dr. Doni, uh, short question, please. Yeah, can I have two short questions? <laughs> no, one is, um, it's been a, a dilemma for many of, uh, especially public authorities, because there are different uh, uh, kits for uh, doing zero survey, and uh, we also face our dilemma when we dip in Manto. So, uh, when you compare these two, uh, what is the, uh, which one is better in which situation? Can, can, you, can you elaborate on that? Uh, I guess it really depends on the research questions in the, in the mm -hmm. beginning. If we could just want to see the, a, a more wide scale, uh, wide scale prevalence, I think it might be uh, useful to use the fortress, and that's what the uh, Office of National Statistics here in the UK uses during its first, I think, first uh, several runs. They use the fortress uh, rapid test, where they actually send the uh, the kit to to participants rather than healthcare workers coming to coming to the population or asking them to come into the hospital. So it really depends on the questions. And I think, although I I'm I'm quite biased to say that okay, the MSD is good and that, but it's not always feasible. So I think the Fortress rapid test has its own use. OK. The second one is, uh, what will be your recommendation for the public health authorities, particularly in developing countries, when they want to do a, a zero preference survey? What, what should they look into before they do that? Well, well, I think first and foremost, it's the resources first, I think, Dr. Doni. Uh, yes. it, would be, it would be good if we could have set up a, uh, a system where we periodically monitor not only SARS-CoV-2, maybe measles. For example, if we only rely on vaccination records, sometimes we miss um, uh, the population immunity. But if we manage to, to get the dynamic of population immunity over time, we could tell whether vaccination has been optimal or suboptimal as well as we could see whether the susceptibility of population is increasing or not, which is uh, very, very risky if there's an, a huge outbreak. So I think it's good that we talk about this, but, um, but we, I think there are still steps away um, where, where, whether we can implement it um, wide scale. Okay, thank you. Thanks to you, Dr. Vega. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vega, for the nice presentation. Yeah. I, I think we can move to our last presenter, uh, but um, different from the uh, uh, previous list, uh, last presenter will be uh, Livia Siricruz. Yeah, thank you. Um, good afternoon, and again, thank you for the guests and uh, uh, other participants. Uh, my name is Livia Da Cruz. I was working with Border Aid in Timor Leste as a program manager. Um, let me share my screen first. How could I see? I'm sorry. Sharing the. How can I share this? You can find the share screen button <coughs> with the green. Green color? Yes. All right. Um, Dr. Eggy, Dr. Alicia, is same with Edmund working? Yes, on um, behalf of uh, right. Ed working. Okay. Thank you. Mom, let's... Wait, um, share the screen. Okay. Oh my God! 
Okay, so what is it okay for my name? If you have the difficulty, maybe the community can share the slide for you. Uh, wait, it's coming. Oh yeah. oh, yes. Okay. I'm sorry to take time. No, it's okay. Yeah. Um, uh, today, I would like to uh, share the assessment in healthcare facility uh, during COVID uh, period uh, related on water sanitation and hygiene uh, aspect in um, two districts. We call Manufahi and Likisa in um, Timor Leste. Um, this is, uh, before I present the result of the assessment, uh, this slide is only an introduction to uh, context of Timor-Leste. Um, as uh, some of you may be knowing already that uh, Timor-Leste is a small country, that it's not uh, as big as a uh, other country with a uh, total population is uh, 1.2 million with over 70% uh, living in rural area. Uh, in rural, healthcare facility reported uh, lack access to water sanitation and hygiene. Um, some of the challenges also is uh, limited nationally available data on was in was in healthcare facility in Timor. Uh, COVID-19 emits uh, renewed attention to basic hygiene uh, for infection prevention and uh, control. Uh, the assessment conducted with using uh, several methodology in both uh, districts. <clears throat> it's like uh, assessment conducted in all healthcare facility in both districts, uh, cover uh, 55 in total, which uh, cover to health post in village level and a community health center in a sub district level. Uh, there are uh, in two districts, there is no uh, hospital uh, level care. Uh, tools we develop, uh, tools were developed by adopting and using by several agency uh, and also organizations. And uh, the assessment used the M water apps, uh, paperless the deployed, um, GPS points and data collection, uh, cloud data storage and uh, analysis. Um, the result that uh, found in general and uh, characteristics are uh, the first one is almost in uh, healthcare facilities and had a general outpatient ward. Um, the second one is almost all facility had at least one medical doctor, but uh, midwife and nurse were not as uh, uh, common. Uh, the third one, uh, men is dominated work as a, a doc, medical doctors, nurse, and a maintenance staff workforce. However, women were uh, represented more commonly across health uh, volunteer, midwife, and uh, cleaning rules. Uh, the assessment result also uh, relate on water and sanitation in healthcare facility. Uh, for water, the first one, the majority of facilities meet the basic service level. Uh, the second point uh, from the funding is water uh, reliability was reported as being limited uh, both across the year and uh, through, uh, throughout the day. Uh, the, uh, the third one, sorry, the uh, uh, particularly during uh, the uh, dry seasons, uh, for example, in August and October, where over 70% of facilities reported water uh, storage short stays. In um, uh, sanitation part, uh, the first one is all facilities have an improved toilet on site, but only 11% meet the basic service level. The second one, most facilities do not provide a toilet that are accessible to people with a limited mobility are not uh, sex, uh, sex uh, segregated or uh, separated from staff and also uh, patients. Uh, 
Uh, you can see the ideally photo we took in one of the facility, which is ideal inclusive toilet in a healthcare facility. Uh, the next slide it's about uh, result that uh, find, uh, found related on hygiene. Uh, the first one is almost half of the facility have uh, amenities for hand uh, hygiene at point of care and also at point of uh, uh, toilets. And uh, training the uh, others uh, finding is uh, training for hand hygiene was common for healthcare worker. Uh, the next slide, it's about uh, waste management. There is also a finding uh, of a waste management in healthcare facility. Uh, one is uh, almost half of the facility do not uh, segregating waste. Uh, sharp waste was more commonly safely disposed than infection waste. Uh, the, the one interesting finding is uh, placental waste was not reported to be safely disposed of in a, any healthcare facility. Uh, it's almost uh, reported that a family take the placenta home uh, due to the culture and belief in uh, Timo. Uh, then, sorry. Next slide is about environment cleaning. Uh, the assessment also finding uh, the environment uh, cleaning that report uh, two uh, third of facility do not have uh, guidelines. And the, the next point is uh, material required for the cleaning were available in over half of the uh, facility. Uh, this is the specific finding uh, about the uh, COVID-19 analysis uh, compared with uh, to the requirements outlined in Timor-Leste uh, COVID-19 clinical management guidelines. So um, I won't read all, all the analysis, but I would like to uh, read one of the examples that most common. Uh, that you can see in the last one is like uh, PPA should be available for staff uh, managing waste. This is the, the guidelines, but in the, in the uh, worst implications on the uh, guideline implementations is uh, just under half of the facility could meet these uh, guidelines. And uh, another uh, other example on a uh, waste uh, management is uh, waste management according to a routine uh, procedure, including solid bi biological waste being incinerated. But in the, in the impl implication of uh, worse, most facility will not meet these guidelines. Other example also, uh, high to surface uh, should be clean at daily, uh, at, uh, at least daily. Uh, this guideline could be made in over two uh, or third of the facilities. Lithia, uh, I'm I'm sorry, Lithia, yeah, you yeah. still have uh, one minute left. So yeah, mm -hmm. other good funding is uh, most facility reported having uh, subsequent uh, ventilations and um, other uh, good uh, good uh, finding also almost all facility that provided housing uh, promotions. So. Uh, last slide, it's about the recommendations. Uh, on the recommendations, we would like to uh, address only, uh, not only for the infrastructure things, but we would, would like to address the, who, uh, the uh, practical step by uh, HW, WHO in wars and healthcare, and also uh, some of the uh, sector strengthening things. So several, like nine recommendations is there. Uh, for example, like conducting situation assessments, set, uh, set target, establish national standards, improve and maintenance infrastructure, monitoring and review data, develop health workforce, engage with community, conduct operational, including the financial. That's all my presentations. Thank you. Obrigado. Uh, terima kasih. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, nice topics. Uh, Dr. Angi, may I have your question first? Yes, I have uh, one uh, short question. Uh, your study uh, showed that uh, the infection control or wash uh, <coughs> were not meet your requirement. So how about your 
um, incidents, COVID-19 incidents in your population. And also the incidence of COVID-19 infection in your healthcare worker. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for the questions. I think um, uh, Cipriano is uh, one of the uh, one of the staff that conduct the assessment. Maybe Cipriano, you can have a like answer for the doctors. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, raise this uh, question. It's um, a very good uh, question related to uh, our. Um, Presentation, it's my really was the presence. So I think, as you know, that in, in Timor Leste, when we talk about the COVID 19, is the what I, I said, the, the, the trans, uh, what I mean, the transportation um, uh, COVID 19. So uh, why did they work in, in 20, uh, 20, uh, 2019 with the COVID 7? So uh, the COVID is. Uh, Uh, sorry, you're uh, mute. Um, so I think um, uh, actually uh, the number is, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, okay. And how about the positivity rate uh, from the populity, uh, uh, your population? And maybe compare with your healthcare worker. Do you have any data? Actually, we have the, the data, but not not the specific data. Uh, uh, so uh, actually, we have the, the data for the uh, for uh, for the um, uh, for the community in the in general. So um, the number is not uh, exactly um, I remember, but it's it's uh, um, mostly in. in um, in urban uh, area, it's um, uh, I think it is uh, there were the incidents with the uh, rural uh, uh, health workers um, where at the healthcare facility uh, uh, it's need to be to be to be to be uh, close. It's uh, growing in other um, particularly. particularly we. Uh, actually, we have the uh, data. Okay. So, uh, in, mostly in Timor Leste, we have the high, uh, also high risk uh, for this uh, COVID, the COVID, uh, COVID nineteen compared with the other, uh, with the other, other countries. We have the, uh, we have the other research talk about uh, specific for the for the health worker. But in this presentation, it does uh, show to you. But uh, the, uh, the, the the data uh, is we we have the mostly. That's the general for the general community in the country. Yeah. So, do you think wash have impact to the incidence of COVID nineteen in your country? Yeah. The the one thing is uh, we have the lack of the uh, wash itself in the in uh, even in the community level also at the uh, healthcare uh, healthcare facility level. Actually, we compare with the the GMP as you know that uh, we have. Uh, Mostly we not uh, reach to the basic uh, surface level, but mostly we are that's really that, um, uh, uh, the limited and no surface, no surface level. So this is from our program. Instead, the one of the um, as a one of the, the main factor is affected to the uh, the IPC itself. Uh, one one issue is the wash itself. Thank you so much, Edmund and Livia. Thank you, Dr. Eddie. Thank you, Dr. Angi, Dr. Doni. Uh, thank you. Um, interesting study, and it's very important as related to the uh, control of the COVID. Uh, what was the response from your uh, policymaker when you uh, have you presented this to, to them? And if, if, if so, what was the response? Sorry, we uh, a bit uh, lost your questions, Doctor. Yeah, actually, uh, please. Actually, we have a very strong relationship with the uh, with the government. So, in our this report, um, 
uh, even we did we have the closely collaboration with the with the government at the national and uh, sub district uh, level so um the, the some of the our recommendation it's really uh, pay attention by the the government like uh, um in um last um, to uh, one uh, one year that they um uh, what i mean is uh, they really, really paid it, uh, attention for this in uh, also um, at the municipality and national level um, through the our uh, health working group. So we present also to the uh, to the group, and then they also uh, we um, ask that they put on their planning how while they do the some intervention need to uh, care also. Uh, uh, for the uh, was itself. Mm -hmm. um, do you see the patterns as significantly different between those mm -hmm. who are in a rural, urban and, and, and rural areas? Uh, can you repeat, mm -hmm. man? Sorry, we, we can hear uh, clearly. Your your questions. Uh, you found this there are many health facilities which with not adequate uh, wash uh, facilities. But which one is more prevalent? Is it in the the urban uh, health facilities or in rural health facilities, or is it distributed evenly in terms of those facilities? And what kind of what kind of uh, differences between those things um i think from the assessment that we did it's mostly covered for the rural uh it's in a village level for uh healthcare uh for a clinic and also uh csc community health centers and um the uh, accessibility for the was it's mostly lack in a in a urban a rural uh, but also depend on the uh, geographically. Sometimes the, the facilities um, uh, take place in a lowlands and um, uh, in the highlands, and then the water and also the source in the in the low. So it's a bit uh, a bit uh, difficult to access to the water source, and also um, uh, uh, it's an effect to the uh, how people can a patient can access to the toilet and also uh, hygiene. Yeah. So it's more on a more in a, a rural a rural community or rural facility. Is it yeah. correspond with the COVID uh, prevalent in this area? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. so I think the the uh, actually the COVID nineteen as in Indonesia or states it's covered for the uh, the whole area to the same or with the. Uh, um, in, in our country. So the, the one thing is, uh, as you know, that just going to share with you, uh, I think uh, also, uh, uh, even as you know, that the COVID is spread uh, for the whole country, but the uh, one thing that is difficult for me, uh, for the, the our government, especially for the government, it's hard uh, for them to cover for what was uh, related to the awareness of <laughs> our community. Sometimes, um, uh, we need the, the, our health worker is there, but the community will run away because they are not willing to get a faction. That's the that's the one uh, one challenge also uh, for the uh, our government, especially for the health worker, uh, to reach the our community. Yeah. Thank you very much, Back to you, Dr. Raji. Uh, thank you. Last question. Uh, you may aware that the some publication report that. Um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus um, can still be detected in environment such as water and yeah under environment uh, even the soil. Uh, in your study, do you uh, do did that kind of experiment? No, we, we, uh, the our study uh, we just um, focusing in general, not uh, focusing to the, the clinical the clinical. Uh, aspect so that uh, i think uh, uh, just uh, just based on the guideline like we just focus on the on five main things like uh, environment uh, environmental uh, for the uh, the waste management 
water, sanitation, and hygiene. And hygiene. Not the clinical uh, issue. We don't uh, deeply talk about the clinical issue. Uh, no, I mean that you. Um, yeah, yeah. Sampling, some had a sample from the water and or soil. Uh, or other environment sample and check it with the uh, PCR to know that the no no, yeah. no no okay no. yeah yeah okay yeah. thank you thank you thank you for your response because we um uh, uh we already reach our end of this uh, oral presentation session. Thank you so much for all judges, Dr. Anggi and also Dr. Doni and all presenters. Um, I will close this session. Thank you so much for your uh, attention and don't forget to join um, day two of, of our GAMMA ICTM 2022 uh, tomorrow, um, maybe at uh, 8.30 at 30 and okay see you tomorrow bye bye okay bye thank you thank you all bye thank you dr eggy bye bye, bye. see you all